Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we are benchmarking a cargo planes load worth of graphics cards in the new Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 game. Also, it is crazy windy here right now. So sorry about that for those of you listening with headphones. Not much more I can do about it. It is forecast to blow its backside off for at least the next eight hours. So yeah. Anyway, the game was released a few days ago now. I pre-ordered it for testing and the second it was available, I got to it only to waste an enormous amount of time downloading the 100 gigabyte game via Steam, but also not, not really via Steam. For whatever reason, Microsoft didn't use the Steam servers, at least for the bulk of the installation. Instead, you download just a 500 megabyte mini installer from Steam, which downloaded quickly and effortlessly, I might add. It then loads an inferior installer, which kept bugging out on our test system, either crashing or pausing and not downloading anymore. And that forced me to download the game on my main PC and then copy all that data across the network to the test system. So that kind of sucked. And sadly, I wasn't alone. Plenty of people had various issues downloading the game with the external installer. So not a great start. Thankfully though, the installation pain was worth it as the game is incredible. Visually, the game's breathtaking. And I'd say what we're looking at here is truly next gen stuff. From a technical standpoint, the game's also very impressive, though on the hardware front, there are some limitations that I'll discuss towards the end of the video. Now, Flight Simulator 2020 has been built upon ASBO's in-house game engine, and it uses Microsoft's Bing Maps to access over two petabytes of data from the cloud on demand, allowing it to simulate the entire Earth. Using Microsoft's Azure technology, the game analyzes the map data to generate photorealistic 3D models of buildings, roads, trees, grass, water, terrain, and so on. There's a lot, lot more to it. A lot of stuff we could basically spend a 20 minute video talking about, but for this content, we wanna focus on PC hardware performance, or more precisely, what kind of GPU do you need to take flight in Flight Simulator 2020? To answer that question, we'll be testing 28 GPUs, and we'll be doing so at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K using the ultra and medium quality presets. Now for benchmarking the game, I'm using the Sydney Australia landing challenge. And once loaded in, I allow 30 seconds for the game to actually load everything. For whatever reason, the game takes about a minute to load even on a high speed NVMe SSD. Then it takes a further 30 seconds before you stop seeing huge frame time spikes. Anyway, after that, you're good to go. And in my case, get testing. Running the benchmark pass for 60 seconds. I've also dumped our Intel test system in favor of the Ryzen 9 3950X for this testing. And along with the 16 core 32 thread processor, we've got 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200CL14 memory. Then finally, the latest AMD and NVIDIA drivers have been used and both claim support for Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. Now, before we jump into the results, I just need to stress that for this game, you don't really require more than 30 FPS. The game is smoother with 60 FPS, for example, but to play and enjoy Flight Simulator 2020, 30 FPS is perfectly fine. Okay, let's jump into the results. Starting with the 1080p Ultra results, we see that the frame rates aren't quite what you'd normally expect to see under these conditions, but then Flight Simulator 2020 isn't your typical game. Fortunately, as I mentioned a moment ago, the game is very playable at 30 FPS. So keeping that in mind, you really can enjoy the breathtaking visuals and absolutely insane render distances with fairly modest hardware. Here I'd recommend at least a Radeon RX 5600 XT or GTX 1070 Ti, or if we're talking current gen hardware from Nvidia, the RTX 2060. The higher end GPUs are CPU limited at this resolution, and this wasn't as much of an issue at 1440p, and it wasn't at all a problem at 4K, but we'll talk more about CPU performance towards the end of the video. But due to those limitations, the 2080 Ti is just a few frames faster than say the 2070 Super and 1080 Ti. Increasing the resolution to 1440p heavily reduced the number of GPUs that were able to deliver playable performance. For around 30 FPS on average, you'll require an RTX 2060 Super or RX 5700. Certainly not crazy demands for 1440p gaming, but I think quite a few of you will be shocked by just how low the frame rates are. Then for a smoother experience here, you'll ideally want an RTX 2070 Super or 2080. Now, for those of you wanting to play at 4K with the ultra quality settings, well, right now your options are the RTX 2080 Ti, and that's really it. And even then, there are sections of the game that we'll look at in a moment that crush even the 2080 Ti. So this really is a game for next generation hardware. 
Still, for the most part, you'll see between 30 to 40 FPS on average with the 2080 Ti using the maximum quality preset. Given how crazy the demands on hardware are with the ultra quality preset, I thought I'd also test the medium quality preset and here are the 1080p results. Again, we're running into a serious CPU bottleneck with the Ryzen 9 3950X, limiting performance to 66 FPS on average with an RTX 2060 Super and up. That said, we'll still see 60 FPS or better on average with the GTX 1070, so here you'll be getting a great experience with current gen mid-range hardware like the 5600 XT. The game was also very playable on entry level stuff like the GTX 1650 and RX 570, though the Radeon GPU in this matchup did fare considerably better, boosting the average frame rate by 14%. The 8GB version of the 5500 XT was also a lot smoother than the 4GB model, boosting the 1% low performance by 18%, so ideally you're going to want at least 6GB of VRAM at 1080p using the medium quality settings. Even at 1440p, the game was still CPU limited with the medium quality preset, as we saw the same average frame rate performance with the RTX 2070 Super, 2080, 1080 Ti, 2080 Super, and 2080 Ti. The good news though being that entry level GPUs such as the RX 580, 5500 XT, and GTX 1650 Super were still able to deliver playable performance, with around 30 FPS on average. Parts such as the 5600 XT and RTX 2060 were again very smooth, keeping 1% lows over 40 FPS, and this for me was a really nice experience. Although the game didn't look quite as nice when compared to what we saw with the ultra quality preset, I did appreciate how smooth the game was at these slightly higher frame rates when changing things like camera angles for example. Finally, we have the 4K medium quality results, and here the 2080 Ti delivered 54 FPS on average, with a 1% low of 46 FPS. And again, these frame rates provided a very smooth experience in Flight Simulator 2020. Now, with these low quality settings, it is possible to achieve playable performance on even the RTX 2060 Super and RX 5700 XT, though ideally I think you'll want something like a GTX 1080 Ti or 2070 Super, 2080 or anything better. Last up, here's a look at performance with the RTX 2080 Ti at 4K using the ultra quality preset at a few different locations. Again, I'm benchmarking the landing challenge for each one of these airport locations, and as you can see, Sydney, Australia was one of the more demanding locations. Frame rates typically hovered between 30 to 40 FPS under these conditions, though I did see performance plummet to unplayable levels over New York, dropping down to just 17 FPS on average. I also had Tim check those numbers on his 3950X test system using an RTX 2080 Ti at 4K, and he found very similar numbers, though his New York performance was a little bit better, generally hovering around 20 FPS. Still, that's pretty horrible, so until next-gen GPUs arrive, you won't really be able to enjoy areas like this at 4K in all of their glory. Okay, so after three very long days of nothing but benchmarking, and I suppose truth be told, mostly watching load screens, I am finally done with Flight Simulator 2020. Well, at least for now, we'll almost certainly be including the game for future GPU testing, though I think I'll be skipping over it for CPU testing. And this is because unfortunately, Microsoft, at least for now, are only supporting DirectX 11, which I have to say is very surprising as the game would surely benefit from a low level API. I've read reports that the game will be updated at some point in the future to support DirectX 12 along with ray tracing, but no official word on that just yet. So for now at least, this is a DirectX 11 exclusive and that's not good news for CPU scaling. As a result, the game limits itself to using four cores and this really sucks because, as we just saw in a lot of instances, we were CPU limited with the 16 core 3950X, yet the game only used 15 to maybe 20% of the CPU. And the same problem was also seen with the Core i9-10900K, though the higher clock speeds do allow for a little more performance at the lower resolutions. But still, the 10 core processor saw just 4 cores loaded to around 80 to 90%, with the rest doing little to nothing. But given that information, don't go thinking, great, I can stick with my old Core i5 or Core i7 processor if the game only uses four cores. And that's because the game also uses an enormous amount of system memory, and as a result, memory bandwidth is also very important. So CPUs using DDR3 memory are really going to struggle. And the same is also likely true for first-gen Ryzen CPUs, as they suffer from higher memory latency. Therefore, I imagine you're really going to want something like a Ryzen 5 3600 or Core i5-10600K for optimal performance, though the larger caches of the higher-end CPUs could also be beneficial, so this is something we might have to look into. But the point is, 
the 10900K and 3950X aren't well utilized here, and that's a real shame. Also, I mentioned RAM usage a moment ago, and this is a game that's really going to help you justify that 32 gigabyte memory kit. With 16 gigabytes, you are right on the edge, and in fact, Tim and myself often saw memory usage exceed 16 gigabytes, so for optimal performance, 32 gigabytes will be required. Also, as we just saw with the ultra quality preset, the game's a heavy VRAM user. Ideally, even for 1080p, you'll want an 8 gigabyte buffer, though with enough system memory, you can get away with a 6 gigabyte buffer. But be aware, 4 gigabyte cards will cause you some headaches. Then going beyond 1080p, you'll unquestionably require 8 gigabytes of VRAM. As for the GPU, if you're targeting just 30 FPS, and as I've said, this is enough for playable performance, though I'm sure opinions will vary on that one, but assuming that you agree, for 1080p Ultra, you'll require a GTX 1660 Ti, GTX 1070, Vega 56, or a 5600 XT. Then at 1440p, you really need an RTX 2060 Super or RX 5700 series graphics card, and then at 4K, a 2080 Ti. So at this point, you might as well just wait for those next-gen GPUs to arrive. Overall, Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is an incredible looking game that'll almost certainly blow your mind. I know it did mine, I think the same is also true for Tim. I just wish I had countless hours of free time to go sightseeing. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. Uh, if you appreciate the work we do at Harboxed and you want to become part of the Harbour Unbox community, then feel free to check out the link to our Patreon account in the video description. Should be up the top there somewhere. Uh, over there, you get things like access to our exclusive Discord server, Discord chat. Uh, what else do we do? We do a monthly live stream, which will be coming up next week. Not on this channel, but for the Patreon users, the Patreon side channel. Uh, Q&As, behind the scenes videos. Tim just released a cool new behind the scenes series of his stuff. Yeah, anyway, if you're interested, check that out. But if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.